Hello everyone. This talk was originally delivered at the Roden Schwartz Demystifying EMC 2020 event at Silverstone in the UK. Uh, I had numerous requests to make the slides and the presentation available afterwards. Uh, so I've decided to record a presentation based on the slides and make it available to everybody. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is James and I have EMC problems. Specifically, I have other people's EMC problems. I run Unit 3 Compliance, uh, an EMC consultancy in Bradford, West Yorkshire in the UK. And here I help designers of all backgrounds achieve compliance on a wide range of products. Everything from IoT hubs to water treatment reactors and everything in between. Unlike a regular EMC test lab where one might go take your product and at the end of the day be presented with a pass or fail. I specialize in solving the problems that we find during the testing. I bring an extensive product design background uh, to help with this. This gives me the capability to understand the costs involved in product design and why some EMC solutions might be better than others, depending on the product. This ability to solve EMC problems uh, is very valuable. And as an engineer, I certainly find this the most satisfying part of my job. As an EMC problem solver, I see many misunderstandings, a large majority of them related to ground. So in the spirit of presenting this at Demystifying EMC, uh, I wanted to try and tackle some of these common myths. What is this mythical substance called ground? Well, like all good myths, it's surrounded by stories. Stories have two useful powers. Uh, one is that they seem to change with every telling, and the other one is that stories seem to stick. So the more the stories are told, the more they change, and the more they stick, and we seem to get further from the truth. As we'll see, the term ground covers significant, well, ground. I have some good textbooks on the subject, a 1000 page book called Grounds for Grounding by Joff and Locke. Uh, 1000 pages worth of ground, it certainly cured my insomnia. We're certainly not going to cover everything that uh, could be covered in that book. Instead, we're going to look at some key concepts. We'll try and give you a framework, uh, a way of thinking about the ground conductor from an EMC perspective. All these stories about ground, they end up resulting in a lack of clarity. What function it has, where it is, what we might need to be concerned about as engineers interested in EMC. So let's start by reviewing the state of the art of ground and see where we are. To make our circuit work on the circuit board, we're going to need some kind of common voltage reference. The voltage is an analog of the information we want to process in our system. And this common reference point we refer to as ground. It appears on our circuit boards with a variety of different symbols, whether they triangles or lines, and they're all connected together. So we have one ground. The likelihood is that we're using a multi-layer PCB because let's face it, single-sided circuit boards are really last decade now. As part of our multi-layer PCB, we'll usually have at least one dedicated layer for a ground fill, a ground plane. So we have two grounds that we could call ground. If we're really clever, or at least if we think we're really clever, we split our grounds up to avoid problems like ground loops, because as we all know from the stories, that ground loops are a bad thing. So we could split it up into analog ground, power ground, digital ground, maybe even RF ground. The power supply negative wire, well, that's definitely a ground because that's where we connect our scope probe when we're making measurements around our circuit board. And we ground or connect the PCB to a metallic case, usually with some pressed inserts or some threaded points on the casing. Most cabling associated with the system will have a ground in it, 
So we might have to think about grounding the shield of the cable. Uh, we might think of the ground of the, the shield of the cable. And also we might think about a ground plane or an image plane underneath a monopole antenna that makes it work properly. There's the mains earth that comes from the electrical distribution board and its bond to the metallic case of the product. We'll also have the connection of protective earth to neutral at the electricity substation. And somewhere along the line, there'll be a copper rod driven into the earth. Inside the building that our product is perhaps housed in, there'll be metallic building structure elements, maybe steel beams, pipes, flooring. These will all be cross bonded together to form part of the ground. And there'll be a lightning conductor because, well, where else does lightning like to go to? So by that count, we've got about 15 or more places that we could call ground. Taking off all of the other hats that we might have to wear during our day job, electronics design, safety, from an EMC perspective, which of these grounds are we most interested in? Well, every electronic product concerned with EMC has a circuit board in it somewhere. These circuit boards are usually the reason that we have EMC problems. Either we have too much noise present on the circuit board and it escapes, which gives us an emissions problem, be it conducted or radiated. Or perhaps the system itself is too sensitive to noise and external noise corrupts the information or operation of the board, in which case we now have immunity problems. With this in mind, the circuit board, the PCB and related grounding, that's going to be the focus for much of this presentation. That's not to say that other grounds aren't important for EMC, but these are certainly the most pressing ones. It's going to be helpful to try and classify the different types of ground. What, what is the taxonomy of the ground? To classify things, we need to ask ourselves questions about it and try and file things into different categories. So the two key questions that we're going to ask ourselves are, number one, does the ground normally carry current? Well, if it's a conductor, it probably does, but let's see if we can dig in and find out why this might be important. It's really tempting to think of ground as an equipotential point, a, a voltage reference that we need for circuits to work. Whilst this is true on a basic level, it only gets us so far. It's great for considering potential dividers and op-amps where currents are minimal, where things operate at DC, but for EMC, this definition just doesn't cut it. A voltage merely represents the potential difference between two points, whereas EMC performance is dictated primarily by the current. We need to consider the current flow in the ground conductor. And to do this, we're going to need to dive into some advanced electronics. What happens when we close the switch? And it's okay. I said advanced electronics. I'll give you a moment to think about it. Who guessed at this one? You did? Well done. The current flows in the loop. The LED lights up. Everything works correctly. The key thing I'd like to point out here is that the current flows in a loop. Perhaps this is obvious, but it's worth stating. Current flows in a loop. Current always returns to the source at which it was created. In this instance, we ask ourselves, does it normally carry current? And the answer is yes. This is a signal ground. This is one that we're very interested in when it comes to EMC. We have to get away from this idea that ground is some kind of infinite sink, a place that we can pour current and it goes away nice and tidily, and we don't really have to deal with the after effects. It always makes its way back to the source because current flows in a loop. It always makes its way back to the source eventually. And depending on how it makes its way back, well, it might not be particularly welcome when it arrives. There are grounds that don't carry current during normal operation. A safety ground, like the protective earth conductor in the AC mains distribution is a good example of this. Does it normally carry current? No, 
Instead, this ground serves to protect the user from hazardous voltages on the metal outside of a product by returning the fault current to the point at which it was created at the electricity substation further down the line. So, does it normally carry current? No. Well, mostly no. It can still be important for EMC. In actual fact, it is likely that it is going to carry some current. So in this scenario, if we consider a class one power supply, this is where the mains earth is being used as a safety safeguard, there's going to be some common mode noise on the live and neutral because the likelihood is that we're using some kind of switch mode power supply. The return path for this common mode noise, because current flows in the loop and current always returns to the source, is going to be via the safety ground once it's passed through the 50 ohm measurement network inside the lizard. If we disconnect this safety earth, we'll see the emissions drop as we break that return path. We increase the impedance of the return path. So in reality, most of these safety grounds are going to conduct some current in normal operation, even, one like, even ones like this where it's not its primary function. Okay, after having established whether our ground normally carries current or not, the second question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the frequency of this current? When we think about EMC, we're often operating in the frequency domain. So this question, perhaps it's a, a good question to ask. We're going to illustrate it using this example. We have a regular circuit board, a multi-layer board. We have ICs on layer one, and a trace connecting the two. On layer two, of a ground, on layer two of the PCB, we've got a ground plane. The ground connections of the devices, the TX and RX, go straight into the ground plane. Current moves in the blue trace from TX to RX. So given that we've established that current flows in a loop, and given it returns to the source, all of the options this current has to return from Rx to Tx to complete its loop, where does the current flow in this plane? Well, the answer depends on the frequency of the signal. For DC, the return current spreads out over the entire plane. In this case, the current, the return current, is following the path of least resistance. The equation that gives us resistance, rho L over cross-sectional area. Rho is the resistivity of the material. L is the length and the cross-sectional area is just that, the thickness of the copper. For the path of least resistance, the difference in resistance is very small between the different paths because the length difference is not very big. So therefore the current is going to spread out into the entire plane going to take up all of that copper. What happens when we start to turn up the frequency though? Well, not much initially. Here we're running at 50 Hertz, a typical power line frequency in Europe. As you can see, the current still spreads out over the entire plane. At 500 Hertz, still no appreciable change. We're still operating at a fairly low frequency. As we start getting into the kilohertz region, something interesting starts to happen. The current in the ground plane begins to shift. It starts to be biased towards the original trace carrying the outgoing current. 50 kilohertz, the current in the ground plane is flowing closer still to the outgoing trace. At 500 kilohertz, the current in that ground plane is starting to follow the trace almost exactly. Now, we're only just getting started in the EMC frequency range. In modern digital electronics, 500 kilohertz is not that fast, it's, it's slow. But from a current flow perspective, we're into high frequency territory. Five megahertz, nearly all of the current is flowing in the plane directly underneath the outgoing trace. And this only gets more concentrated under that trace the higher in frequency that we go. So at DC, 
A current in that plane follows the path of least resistance. But we're now working at AC, so we don't consider resistance, we consider impedance. For AC, it's seeking out the path of least impedance is the current. In this instance, this is primarily dictated by the inductance, L. An inductance L, in this instance, is primarily dictated by the area A. This is the area of the loop. The smallest loop area available to our return current is directly underneath the trace, outward trace, carrying the current. If we think about a cross section of a circuit board, we only have a fraction of a millimeter, a few thousandths of an inch between layer one and layer two. In 3D space, this loop area turns out to be the smallest loop that the return current can flow in, hence the reason it flows directly underneath the outgoing trace. If we want to think about the frequency characteristics of voltage against frequency for a square wave, we'll have a Fourier series of infinitely odd harmonics. But that's for voltage. In this case, where we're thinking about the current, it's slightly different. For digital logic, where an output buffer is trying to charge up the input capacitance of a high impedance buffer, the current flow appears to have very high frequency spikes where the logic levels change from one to zero and from zero to one. Once the capacitor is charged up, there's very little current flow indeed. So predominantly these very fast spikes on the leading and falling edges of the logic pulse carry very high currents and very high frequencies. We're talking currents in potentially in the range of amps. So any digital signal, dependent on the rise and fall time, any digital signal is going to be a high frequency signal. This is true even for low speed signals such as I squared C or SPI. So for any digital logic signal, we have to consider that the return current is going to flow in a reference plane directly underneath that trace. For analog power, it's slightly different. Predominantly, this is lower frequency. Some of this is thanks to the decoupling within the supply. That decoupling ends up averaging the current draw out. We can think of power supply traces as transmission lines. And we do need to provide an adjacent ground return for those, but that's slightly out of the scope of this talk. We're just going to look at the ground for now. So these frequencies aren't exact. They depend on the loop geometry, they depend on this PCB stack up, they depend on a number of other factors. But it does serve to illustrate this principle nicely of just how current flows in a ground plane on a circuit board. I can't stress how useful this is to understand and imagine where the current is flowing at different frequencies. This is the key to unlocking EMC. I can still remember my first moment when I was exposed to this idea and it was a real oh wow moment because everything seemed to click into place. It's like I'd been given glasses that meant I could understand where EMC problems were arising and how to mitigate them. So I really want you to keep this in mind throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, so what? That's how high frequency ground current flows. Why is that important? Why should I care? Well, one of the reasons we should care is to ask ourselves what happens when the return path is not an ideal plane like we've seen before. There are many varieties of non-ideal ground and let's try and illustrate this by looking at a common one. In this instance, the trace, the outward trace carrying our signal current is rooted over a split in the ground plane. In the white area of the ground plane, there is no copper. We can still verify that the ground is continuous from a DC perspective. We can bleep it with our multimeter. But at some point, we're going to have to think about how does the current flow? At DC, DC just deals with it. It continues to follow the path of least resistance. 
in this case, the path of least resistance is where there is copper. So there's not going to be any flow of current through the high resistance split. All of the current is going to flow around the corner straight between the ICs. But we know that high frequency current wants to follow the outgoing trace underneath the plane. So what does it do when it gets to the gap? Depending on the slot geometry, it still wants to follow the path of least impedance. Not the path of least resistance, the path of least impedance. Depending on the slot geometry, this could be the capacitance across the slot, or perhaps it might be the edge of the slot itself. It will make a small loop and travel around the edge of the slot. Like I say, it depends on the slot geometry, how wide it is and how long that slot is. Either way, it's going to follow that path of least impedance. When we have a current flowing through an impedance, it's going to generate a voltage across it. For a start, this noise voltage is superimposed on our wanted signal, which gives us the potential for some signal integrity problems. What's worse than that from an EMC perspective is we have two metallic elements that are separated by something driving a voltage between them. Now, where I come from, that's called a dipole antenna. That's one of the most efficient radiating structures that we have. So this slot structure ends up looking a bit like an antenna. It's not a very good antenna and its effective frequency will depend greatly on the geometry of the slot, how deep it is, how big the circuit board is, but it's an antenna nevertheless. So this can result in some fantastic emissions problems. The radiated field from that can be picked up by the antenna in our chamber. And as you can see from the plot on the bottom right hand corner, we can have all kinds of problems. In this case, we're failing the class A limit by almost 20 dBs. Due to the principle of reciprocity, when you have an antenna that has a certain gain at one frequency, it's good at emitting and it's equally good at receiving. So we can also, by introducing this non-ideal ground, introduce immunity problems into our equipment as well. How can we get around this? One option is that we can bridge the gap with some low impedance components. Perhaps these would be zero ohm links, or if the two sides of the plane were actually different voltages, different like a voltage supply plane and ground plane, we could insert coupling capacitors to provide a return path, a local return path. What we're trying to do is to try and keep out any uncontrolled return path currents, be that current around the edge of the loop or current bridging across from one side to the other. These components still have an impedance associated with them, primarily an inductive in impedance, but if in the case of a capacitor, it also has capacitive impedance as well. So because they have some impedance, they're not perfect. We'll still get a voltage drop across there and that will still cause us some EMC problems. The other way to get around it is just don't do it in the first place. Never route, tra never route traces across a plane spit, always go round. Here's a great example. Um, this is a customer's product that I was working on recently. Uh, in this case, the SD card tracers that are running at about 50 megahertz clock are crossing this nice split between a rear earth connection and the system ground plane. They're crossing it by approximately three millimeters. This very, very small crossing of the plane split was enough for the product to fail the class A emissions limits by six dBs. This is easily solved by crossing, uh, by uh, extending the ground plane underneath those traces. But it just goes to show that you don't need to violate these requirements by much for them to start to cause some interesting problems. So, We've established that for good EMC performance, we should try and minimize our loop area. So for our each outward signal in red, we're going to need some kind of local high frequency return in blue. That's for every signal, for every signal. Obviously there's not enough room on the circuit board to do this. So 
wouldn't it be so much easier if there was, I don't know, some kind of return path that they could all share? Step up to the plate. Never fear, ground plane man is here. Low inductance, global coherent current path is what a ground plane provide, provides us. Any point to any point. It keeps loops small, it's going to keep our EMC emissions low, and it's going to keep our immunity in a good shape as well. This is why you'll hear people like me banging on about ground planes till the cows come home. So thank you, ground plane man. What a hero. The next section I'm going to look at busting some myths. These myths are all based on quotations from my customers. Uh, these range from experienced engineers to people just starting out on their electronics journey. Uh, many of these I've heard more than once, so these are obviously popular sources of confusion. So let's dive into some of these. Could we just connect it to a quiet ground or to earth and see what happens. Uh, certainly, sir. Please indicate on the diagram the location of this quiet ground. We've established already that ground is not an infinite sink for current. Current flows in loops and current always returns to the source. So the principle of connecting a wire up to the mains earth connection to somehow magically get rid of this noise is a complete fallacy. Mobile phones and satellites, they function correctly from an EMC perspective without any connection to an external quiet ground. Just kidding, you have to have a green wire connected to your mobile phone for it to work properly and obviously all satellites have a green and yellow wire going back down to quiet earth. EMC performance comes from within the product. It does not come from without the product. We have to think about what's going on inside. I'm trying to avoid creating a ground loop because as we know, ground loops from the stories are a bad thing, but are they really an EMC problem? Well, let's ask ourselves: where does the current flow? OK, here's what most people think of as a ground loop. We have uh, a sensor connected to one ground and we have a measurement amplifier of some kind connected to another ground. The measurement amplifier has a single ended analog input and there's some voltage difference between the two grounds. Now you have a voltage difference. This is going to drive a current through, the, through that connection and cause some interference. Well, that's not really a satisfactory picture, so let's try and unpack what a ground loop looks like in reality. So our high current loop is predominantly low frequency. Low frequency current wants to follow the path of least resistance. Because the ground for the signal is connected uh, near the load and also near the voltage source, this ground appears in parallel with the wanted ground in the high current loop. Because we're following the path of least resistance, some proportion of the high current loop is going to flow in the low current analog sensor loop. But you have a current flowing through a resistance. This creates a noise voltage. The noise voltage appears in series with the circuit. And it's possible that that noise voltage ends up being in band in the frequency band that we're interested in for our analog input. This is how we get noise interfering with our wanted signal. This can also happen if the high current loop and the low voltage sensitive analog loop are somehow aligned and we have magnetic field coupling between the two. For high frequency, this doesn't necessarily happen. High frequency current wants to flow in the smallest loop area in the path of least impedance. The inductance of this extra area of the ground loop is going to prevent high frequency currents from flowing in the signal ground, in the signal ground conductor. From this, we can infer that ground loops are more of a low frequency system design problem. 
rather than an EMC problem. And we have ways to fix them. One option is that we can block the noise. So we could use an opto isolator or a common mode choke in series with the wanted signal. We could try and isolate the loop. So we could disconnect the connection between the sensor ground and the common ground used for the high, the high current loop. We could try and decouple the signal at the input of the measurement amplifier. Perhaps we don't need as much bandwidth as we think, and we can uh, restrict the, we can filter out some of the noise that is caused from the high current loop. Another option is we can rely on the high common mode rejection ratio of a differential or balanced input on an amplifier to get rid of it that way. We've got multiple options of doing this. The problem is when ground loops bite, and this is when they can become EMC problems. There's a temptation to uh, break a ground loop by disconnecting the screen of a cable at one end of it, or maybe at both ends. And this leads to one of the next misconceptions that I see regularly. I've put a capacitor or a ferrite bead or a resistor in series with my cable shield. Why would I do such a thing? Well, usually because I've read some data sheet or application note on the internet that shows something like this, either a recommendation not to connect the shield at the USB device, or perhaps some application notes saying you should put a bead and a capacitor in series with the ground and the shield. USB in particular seems to be a, uh, a regular source of, of this kind, kind of information. To determine whether or not we should be doing this, we need to ask ourselves, well, where does the current flow? In this instance, we're looking at two types of current. We're looking at the blue current, which is the wanted signal that's inside the shield of the shielded cable. And we have red current as well. This is from the outside of the shield. This is noise from an external system that could potentially affect the performance of our wanted signal. In the case of the blue current, it comes out of the buffer through the resistive load and back to the buffer again because it's flowing in a loop. There's going to be a small amount of noise coupled from this wanted signal onto the inside of the shield. And the shield serves to capture that noise before it gets to our sensitive radiated emissions receiving antenna. And instead, the shield captures it and returns it to the point at which it was created. That's the dashed blue line. For the immunity, we have the red current that's being generated by the cable being exposed to an external radio field. This current also wants to get back to the point at which it's created. A typical example of this path, because this is a bit less well-defined, would be through the shield impedance into the ground of the circuit board, and then maybe capacitively or uh, through a, a ground connection to the chassis, we return to the chassis and then from the chassis capacitively back to the source for which it was created. So we have two loops here. What's going to happen if we put an impedance in series with the shield of the cable? So that impedance inevitably is going to have some inductance. Maybe we fitted a capacitor as well. If we fitted a capacitor and an inductor in parallel, that's going to have some kind of resonance associated with it as well. Either way, we're going to have some kind of voltage across that impedance. We've got a voltage across two different bits of metal. Well, we've just created another dipole antenna. This is going to cause us some radiated emissions problems because the high frequency voltage is going to appear on the shield of the cable. So it's bad for emissions and it's bad for immunity. That generated voltage can also appear common mode and that will cause us some immunity issues as well.
I've only connected the cable shield at one end. This is going back to what we were talking about earlier about how to try and break ground loops. Which end do I need to connect the shield? I get asked this question quite a lot. My answer is generally, as an EMC engineer at any rate, my answer is generally both. Um, with EMC, we're typically dealing with frequencies above 100 kilohertz. In these scenarios, we don't improve the shielding performance of our products by floating the ground at one end. We've seen what the effects of that are above, so I generally recommend both. There are situations where you may, for system design reasons, need to disconnect one end, but you have to do that with your eyes open, knowing that you're going to be creating some EMC problems along the way. The mounting holes are floating and not connected to the ground plane. So most circuit boards need some kind of mounting hole to physically secure them in place. And those mounting holes, sometimes we see them connected to a, a metal chassis ground. We're only interested in this case if we have some kind of metallic chassis. We're gonna take immunity current as an example. So there's current flowing on the outside of our cable because it's being exposed to some kind of radio frequency field. And it wants to return to the source at which is created because current always flows in a loop and current always returns to the source. In this case, it's going to flow through the shield, down through the mounting hole into the chassis, back from the chassis, it will return to its source. The minute we add some kind of impedance in there, a capacitor or perhaps a resistor, even the inductance of something small like a zero ohm resistor is enough to generate a voltage across it. We have two bits of metal separated by a voltage being generated in between them. Well, we've got another dipole antenna. This gives us the capability to couple noise from the outside, the immunity problem that we have, and cause coupling onto our wanted signal. This will affect the performance of the system. It can superimpose that voltage on an analog signal and cause all kinds of haywire. So this is one of the reasons that we generally try and avoid disconnecting our mounting holes from the local ground plane. It's made worse because usually the bond to the chassis is already poor. If we start sticking capacitors in series with the mounting hole, and then we have some inductance associated with the bond between the PCB and the ground plate and the chassis. We've also created a resonator as well, which will give us gain at a certain frequency. So trying to keep all of our impedances as low as possible is not a bad idea. In an ideal scenario, we would connect the shield of the cable directly to the chassis through some kind of a coaxial connector or a well screened cable that has its connector terminated with a low resistance bond to the chassis. This diverts the currents almost straight away back to the point at which they were created without having to travel through the internal circuitry. It's not always possible to do this. The location of the mounting hole can also be an important factor in EMC compliance. In this instance, our mounting hole is quite far away from the edge of the circuit board at which the cable enters. Inevitably, there's going to be some flow of current, either wanted or unwanted, through that section of the ground. We have a voltage generated between two metallic elements. We have some kind of dipole antenna. One end of that dipole is going to be waving up and down quite merrily. The return path for this is going to be capacitively from the outside of the cable shield back onto the chassis, back up through the bond between chassis and PCB. This uncontrolled return path on the outside illustrated by the orange arrows is what gives us a radiated emissions problem. If we move the mounting hole to be close to the point at which the cable is connected to the PCB, we start to divide this current up the voltage that we're generating between chassis and PCB is primarily contained in the area between the circuit board and the chassis. The currents that flow on the outside of the cable 
that are returned through this uncontrolled return path are greatly reduced. So moving our mounting hole so that it's very close to the point at which the cables enter the circuit board is a great way of reducing emissions. We can also think about the distance between the mounting holes as well to try and further reduce that current. At some point, the generated voltage is going to drive a current between the different mounting points. We want to try and return that current to the circuit board in as controlled a fashion as possible. So we might be looking at multiple mounting points spread out over the circuit board. Next myth. I need to provide a separate analog ground plane. I think I've had more EMC problems caused by people splitting ground planes than anything else. Where does this requirement come from? Well, quite often, especially for analog circuits or mixed signal circuits, we'll have multiple ground symbols on a device. This one is a Maxim ADC that I pulled from their website. And they've served us up three ground symbols, ref ground, a ground, and output ground. Well, they obviously given us three symbols. They want us to connect them to three different points. However, when we look at the application note that comes with this, they actually recommend bonding all of these grounds together directly underneath the circuit board, underneath the device itself. Well, hang on a minute. They've given us three grounds but they've told us to connect them all together. Well, why would they do that? The separate grounds give you the option to split the ground plane. Not a firm requirement, it's an option. So why would we want to do that? Well, the oft quoted reason is people say, I want to avoid noisy digital signals from interfering with my ADC. Well, okay, fair enough. But let's ask ourselves, where does the current flow? We're going back to our example of the circuit board. We have a ground plane and our aggressor trace, and we also have our sensitive ADC at the bottom in yellow. At five megahertz, the digital signals that we're so afraid of, the return current is primarily flowing straight underneath the trace. So we're not necessarily concerned about it are we from the ADC's point of view all those return currents are quite a way away so it can't be those we're trying to uh, trying to block out it must be the kilohertz level signals they're, they're the ones that we're most interested in because they're going to be in band no even in the low kilohertz region the current is still following its outward bound trace it's only at the lower frequencies that we start to have the possibility of the current in the ground coupling into the ADC. And even then, not all of the current is going that way. The current's going to have to be of a reasonably high value, and the ADC circuit is going to have to be fairly sensitive and poorly laid out to pick up this interference and translate it into poor readings. One rule of thumb that I've read is that anything less than a 10-bit A to D doesn't need any kind of separate ground planes. Obviously, this is going to be dependent on the system. For something a higher bit count ADC, perhaps with noisy other system elements like motor drives, then yes, we do have to start thinking about separating a ground, but we need to be careful that we don't cross that ground split with any of the traces, that we think very carefully about how we achieve this. So from my perspective, this is a system design problem and not an EMC problem. We're not terribly concerned about this low frequency noise from an EMC perspective. However, our system has to function. And ultimately, even as EMC engineers, we all wear several hats and we want our products to work. So we have to take care to some extent. One way of achieving this system design is to partition our design into functional blocks not only schematically, but physically on the circuit board. In this instance, we're trying to keep the power system away from the analog system to avoid this potential of high power, low frequency currents from being picked up by the analog system. This is also relevant for digital currents because we want to keep the digital currents away from the IO. Any 
stray digital currents that appear on the outside of cables leaving the board are immediately going to give us some kind of EMC problem. And we also want to keep the digital system away from the RF so that high order harmonics don't end up falling in band of our RF system as well. In all of these cases, we're asking ourselves on our circuit board, where does the current flow? Where are the high frequency currents? Where are the low frequency currents? Where are the aggressors and where are the victims? But partitioning the design this way is not the only way. We can also look at vertical partitioning using skin effect and shielding planes in the circuit board to separate out the different blocks. If we put analog and RF on one side of a circuit board, and digital and power on the other side, we can make our design smaller and get inherent shielding from the planes that lie within the board. Here's an example of a split ground plane from a customer. They'd gone to some quite extreme lengths to keep the analog ground on the left separate from the digital and power ground on the right. And the only bridge point was the CPU, which had some A to D converters in and some digital memory interface. What's not shown, there are a couple of traces that do cross the split between the two. Well, we've got a voltage source and we have a metallic element on each side. We've created a dipole antenna. In this case, quite an efficient dipole antenna at one gigahertz. We ended up solving this problem by connecting all of the grounds together. The customer saw no detriment in performance. If they had wanted to keep the plane split, then maybe we could have done something with a dedicated solid plane on layer three to try and detune that antenna or put in components, resistive components, lossy components between each side. And this would have detuned the antenna structure. So this brings on to my favorite joke. What do you call an engineer who splits a ground plane? A customer. It's not to say that you can't split ground planes. I just want you to know why you might need to split, how to split, and what the ramifications are if you do. Unfortunately, due to the short nature of the slot, we couldn't cover everything I wanted to cover about ground. It might have been exhausting, but it certainly wasn't exhaustive. Some of the things that I didn't manage to cover uh, grounding in larger systems is a question I get asked about sometimes. The importance of decoupling uh, and how that relates to high frequency signal integrity. Use of ground planes versus power planes as our high frequency reference in a circuit board and the PCB stack ups that go with them. There's certainly a lot more to talk about. So you know, if you've been affected by any of these issues and you need some advice, then my contact details will be below. I hope we've all learned to understand ground a little bit more. Maybe we have a newfound appreciation for it as our little electron friend clearly does. Like any good relationship, it's about finding the best compromises that work for everybody. In this case, between safety, between system functionality and between EMC, uh, we have to make sure that we talk to our colleagues. We have to explain to them why we need the ground to be a certain way. And we also need to talk to our colleagues and challenge their assumptions about how they think ground works and have a discussion on it. There are always multiple ways of achieving the same result and a compromise can frequently be found. Absolutely the most important question you can ask when thinking about ground and thinking about EMC is, where does the current flow? Am I worried about high frequency noise or low frequency noise? Well, where does the current flow? How best to route signals and design a PCB? Where does the current flow? If I want to make decisions about grounding schemes or decide whether to cross a split or how to cross a split, going near the edge of a plane, where does the current flow? EMC problems, where does the current flow? It is the most important question that you can ask. It's also worth having a word about ambiguity. During this talk, I've thrown the word ground around as if it describes absolutely everything. But in reality, with some judicious use of language, we can define exactly what we mean. 
some people would say use the words ground and earth interchangeably but if we were trying to refer to the green and yellow wire in the AC mains distribution, we should always use the term protective earth, because then we know exactly which conductor we're talking about. From the power supply to our circuit board, we can refer to that black wire, we can refer to it as DC negative rather than ground, because that immediately we know which the DC negative supply is. Instead of saying we should ground something, or we should ground this thing to that thing, Maybe we should say bond or connect instead. Because we know that ground is not some kind of infinite sink where the current wants to go. Current flows in a loop and current returns back to the source. So uh, bonding or connecting is more explicit. I think the one exception that I will generally make is I will refer to the main ground system on a circuit board as, as ground or PCB ground at the best. Um, at some point, you have to call something ground so that's where i'm i'm going to put my flag in the in the ground so that's it from me um, if you like this content i try and post interesting emc content or at least what i consider to be interesting emc content on linkedin usually once or twice a week i'm fairly easy to find and there'll be a link in the description below um, thank you for your time Obviously, I'm not really in the exhibition area. Uh, I was, uh, but you can always contact me on the email address below. And uh, if you have any questions, either stick them in the comments or drop me an email. And thank you very much for your time.